Buenos días. Uh, good morning, good everyone. Morning. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to this webinar on public policies to prevent childhood obesity from a food systems perspective. For the Pan American Health Organization, it is an honor to have such a distinguished gathering of experts, policymakers, researchers, youth, and advocates here today, united in our commitment to accelerate progress on one of the most pressing public health challenges of our time. Overweight and obesity have been a growing challenge in the Americas. Obesity is one of the leading risk factors for many non-chronical diseases, NCDs, including cardi cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and various types of cancer. In 2021, obesity was responsible for approximately 2.8 million deaths from NCDs. NCDs are the leading cause of death in the Americas, accounting for 80% of all deaths of which one third are preventable. Overweight and obesity rates have tripled in the region over the last 15 years, and these conditions currently affect two thirds of the population, making the Americas the region with the highest prevalence in the world. The levels of overweight and obesity among children are also increasing, affecting 33.6% of all children and adolescents aged 5 to, 5, 5 to 19 in the Americas. This is mainly due to low levels of breastfeeding and unhealthy environments in which they grow up, where they are exposed to high availability, affordability and marketing of ultra-processed foods and sugary drinks and to diets lacking in fruits and vegetables. It can affect the immediate health, health of children, their educational attainment and their quality of life. Children living with obesity are likely to continue this condition into adulthood and are at risk, at risk of suffering from NCDs. Childhood obesity is not, not merely a statistic or a trend, it's a complex issue with far reaching consequences. It affects families, communities, and society at large, burdening the healthcare systems, stunting economic growth, and perpetuating cycles of inequality. But perhaps most tragically, it robs our children of the opportunity to live healthy, fulfilling lives. At the heart of this challenge lies our food systems, from the production and distribution of food to its consumption and disposal. Every aspect of our food systems plays a critical role in shaping the health outcomes of children. Today, we delve into the multifaceted nature of childhood obesity, understanding its social and environmental determinants. We will examine the role of all players in shaping the food environments of our children. And most importantly, we will identify identify actionable policy interventions that can serve as the way towards a healthier, more sustainable, equitable future of our youngest generation. But let us not forget that this is not just a technical or scientific endeavor. It's a moral imperative, a call to action that demands chorus, collaboration and urgency. It requires us to confront and trans interest challenge prevailing norms and reimagine our relationship with food in ways that prioritize health and well-being above else, above all else. As we embark on this journey, let us be guided by a shared vision of a world where every child has access to nutritious, affordable, and culturally appropriate food, where schools are safe places with access to healthy food and safe water and where children are protected from the pervasive marketing of ultra processed food and sugary drinks. Thank you once again for joining us and may our discussion today inspire bold action and enduring impacts in addressing childhood obesity. Uh, thank you all, welcome all, bienvenidos a todos. Uh, escuchemos ahora las palabras de apertura de Maike Arts, asesora regional en salud y nutrición de UNICEF. Muchas gracias, Leo, y buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, estoy hablando en nombre de nuestro director regional, que desafortunadamente no pudo estar en la reunión eh, hoy. Eh, 
Nos complace darles la bienvenida al seminario web Políticas Públicas para Prevenir la Obesidad Infantil desde una perspectiva de sistemas alimentarios, organizado conjuntamente por la Oficina Regional de UNICEF para América Latina y el Caribe y la Organización Panamericana de la Salud, con el apoyo especial del Grupo de Trabajo, el Task Force de las Naciones Unidas sobre Sistemas Alimentarios. Como ya eh, escuchamos, durante las últimas de dos décadas hemos sido testigos del preocupante aumento en la prevalencia del sobrepeso en toda la región de América Latina y el Caribe. Los países de esta región no están logrando alcanzar los objetivos, los ob objetos, los objetivos sorry, establecidos en los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible. Como todos sabemos, este problema tiene un gran impacto en la vida de los niños y los niños y exige atención urgente para cambiar la situación. Como explicaremos en este seminario web de hoy, la principal causa del sobrepeso infantil son los entornos alimentarios obesogénicos que promueven el consumo de productos ultraprocesados, así como estilos de vida cada vez más sedentarios. Los sistemas alimentarios actuales han fallado a las niñas y los niños, vulnerando sus derechos a una nutrición, nutrición adecuada, a la salud y a la información. Por lo tanto, mejorar los sistemas alimentarios para la prevención de la malnutrición infantil significa contribuir activa y sustancialmente a la agenda de los derechos del niño. Estamos muy orgullosos del excelente trabajo realizado por los socios de las organizaciones de las Naciones Unidas en toda la región, quienes han apoyado a los gobiernos en el desarrollo de marcos regulatorios para garantizar que las niñas y los niños y, los, y las adolescentes tengan acceso a una alimentación más saludable. Por ejemplo, países como Argentina, Barbados, Brasil, Chile, México, Perú y Uruguay han sido pioneros en la adopción de políticas públicas esenciales, incluyen, incluido el etiquetado frontal de productos ultraprocesados y otras regulaciones relacionadas con la promoción de los productos no saludables, el marketing digital, medidas fiscales y otras acciones. Todavía tenemos un largo camino por recorrer. Debemos acelerar los esfuerzos y fortalecer el trabajo en políticas e intervenciones basadas en evidencia. En los países que han implementado medidas regulatorias relevantes, estas deben ser promovidas ante el público y las medidas deben ser aplicadas estrictamente. En otros países debemos unir fuerzas para desarrollar medidas regulatorias. Estamos unidos como un solo equipo, reconociendo que solo a través de la acción colectiva de las agencias de las Naciones Unidas, los gobiernos, la academia, la sociedad civil, el sector privado y las comunidades, podemos crear un cambio significativo en nuestros entornos alimentarios y proteger el derecho de cada niña y niño y adolescente a la salud y a la nutrición adecuada. Gracias nuevamente por participar en este seminario web y por sus valiosas contribuciones para crear un futuro mejor para los niños, niñas y adolescentes en América Latina y el Caribe. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, Maike. Este webinar es coorganizado entre OPS y UNICEF en el marco del Task Force Regional de las Naciones Unidas sobre la Cumbre de Sistemas Alimentarios que se realizó en 2021, una cumbre de las Naciones Unidas, donde se destacó la necesidad de transformar los sistemas alimentarios para abordar los desafíos como el hambre, el cambio climatológico y la Pobreza. Entonces, en el evento de hoy eh, proponemos abordar la problemática desde un enfoque integral centrado en los sistemas alimentarios y los objetivos son incorporar el enfoque de salud y nutrición como eje central en la transformación de los sistemas alimentarios para prevenir el sobrepeso y obesidad y también presentar acciones concretas y políticas públicas necesarias para transformar los sistemas alimentarios. Um, ustedes abajo en su pantalla tienen uh, un, un, un círculo donde uh, dicen interpretación. Ahí ustedes pueden uh, buscar uh, la interpretación, uh, sea en inglés, sea en español, del, uh, de este webinario. 
Además, hay una función que se llama QIA de, de las preguntas y respuestas, donde pueden poner sus preguntas que las vamos a ir respondiendo en el transcurso del webinar y hay un espacio al final también de, de discusión. Um, pero, ahora, uh, uh, pero por ahora vamos a seguir con nuestra agenda y escuchamos uh, sobre el panorama de todas las formas de malnutrición en nuestra región. Eh, y esta presentación está a cargo de Paula Delis. Ella es especialista de nutrición de la oficina de América. Of the Latin America and Caribbean Office, the UNICEF Latin America and Caribbean Office. Paula, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Leo, and thank you, Mike, for these introductory remarks. And thank you to all of you who've taken the time to join us in this webinar. I'm going to make a very brief presentation on the malnutrition overview of uh, in infants in Latin America and the Caribbean. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And we'll, st we'll start with the nutritional status of children under the age of five in the region. Here. To make it a little more graphic, you can see on the map on the right-hand side, the little blue dots, the UNICEF blue, representing the prevalence of overweight in the region. In 2023, regionally, we reached an 8.6%, way above the world prevalence, which is 5.6%. And then on the other hand, we have what's called the chronic malnutrition, which is represented by the yellow dots. Regionally, it reached 11.5% last year. And we see the world prevalence, which is 22.3%. We're quite below the global prevalence. As for chronic malnutrition, I wanted to mention two countries in particular that um, give us a great deal of concern. One country is Guatemala, where the prevalence of chronic malnutrition is above 40%. And the second country, Ecuador, where the malnutrition prevalence is over 20%. And that's compared to uh, overweight, where 10 countries have a prevalence of over 10%. Nine over 10% and one over 15%, including Panama, Colombia, as you see on the map. They're charted on the map. Panama, Ecuador, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, the Turk and Caicos Islands. I'm not going to go into detail with the rest of the countries because that would take us much too, much too much time to analyze each one. So I'm only going to focus on the, uh, the most outstanding and the most concerning. The data confirm that regionally, the dual burden of malnutrition is a serious problem currently affecting our region and also confirms that there's been insufficient advances to achieve the world's goals of nutrition vis-a-vis uh, -vis the SDGs. Next, please. So on this slide, we see very graphically the trend of the prevalence of chronic malnutrition and overweight in the last 20 years. Maike mentioned it briefly in her introduction, but here we can see it graphically. And on the left, with the yellow, red, and purple colors, we see chronic malnutrition showing the data representing Latin America and the Caribbean, and the way there's been a considerable drop in the last 20 years in chronic malnutrition from 17.8% to 11.5%, which is a good, which is good news. But we still have a long road ahead, particularly in these particular countries that I mentioned. 
And then on the other hand, we have the uh, region of Central America, where the prevalences are still higher uh, compared to the rest of the subregions of the Americas. On the right hand side, in the blue colors, we see the regional prevalence or trend of overweight in the region starting in year 2000 where the prevalence was 6.8 percent which has increased in the last 20 years and has reached an 8.6 percent showing that we are way above the global prevalence and here we see that Overweight affects 4.2 million children under the age of five, which is an alarming uh, figure. We've already briefly mentioned some of the data, and on this slide, what I want you to focus on is on the colors, really. As you see in this map, it's almost all red or orange and stronger red. So in the orange, we have 14 countries that have a mean prevalence of overweight in the children under five. We have nine countries that have a very high prevalence. Those are the ones in red. And one country that has a very, very high prevalence. Next, please. This shows us that 49 Overweight affects 49 million children between the ages of 5 and 19. If we see the colors again, we see that 100% of the map is colored in red, orange, or very red, or almost purple. And we find that 29 countries in the region, which is quite alarming, have a prevalence of over 25%. 25 countries are greater than or equal to 25% and the others are greater than or equal to 35%. Now here, we've seen the data in children under the age of five. This, on the other hand, is overweight in children and adolescents from five to 19, which is even more alarming. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we have a prevalence of 30.6% vis-a-vis the global prevalence, which is 18.2%. And again, in Central America, which is a sub-region of the Americas, is the most affected by this problem, having a prevalence of 33.4%, showing that it's a sub-region that we have to pay special attention to and accelerate actions. And here, we change the topic briefly and speak of breastfeeding and the small child. And of all the indicators, I am going to highlight exclusive breastfeeding because the prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding in this region is 43%, very low compared to the rest of the world where the prevalence is 48%. And on the next slide, we'll see in greater detail the prevalence of breastfeeding, specifically where we have 12 countries in the region with the dark blue showing a prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding of less than 30%, which is very alarming. And we have 11 countries of the region with the lighter blue with a prevalence between 30 and 50%. And finally, we have only four countries in the region having a prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding between 50 and 70%. Next, please. That was a very brief introduction to the situation of malnutrition amongst infants. And it's closely related to the presentation my colleague will be presenting. My colleague Leslie from Pajo and Michelle Alvarez from UNICEF are going to present. That will help you understand a bit better how 
the data is related to the food systems in the region. Thank you very much. Leo, back to you. Thank you, Paula. And I also want to mention that uh, we are recording this session and it will later be available on our webpage. We heard from Paula that the problem of obesity and overweight is almost a pandemic and it is growing. Our region is the one that has the highest rates of overweight and obesity amongst children and adolescents and adults in the world. And now we're going to invite Leslie Vega from Pajo, who's going to talk to us about the impact of food systems in, on health, because all this is related to the food systems. Leslie is a technical officer of malnutrition and food systems at Pajo in Washington. Leslie, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Leo. And I am going to talk to you briefly about the main impact of food systems on health and nutrition. I think that it's important first to speak of what food systems are. And we're including all components, the environment, the population, resources, processes, institutions, infrastructures, as well as all activities from the harvesting, the crop, the production, the processing, distribution, preparation, consumption, and even loss. But it also includes the impact of all these activities in nutrition on and on health, as well as on the social and economic growth, equity, and sustainability of the environment. I think it's important that we recognize that food systems are part of or results of the public policy decisions of the supply systems and chains, both nationally and globally, of individuals and groups that are either public or private who will have an influence on what we eat. Hence, it's so important. And the uh, food systems affect health, and nutrition in different ways. Our current food systems are making us sick, are promoting climate change and undermining health of ecosystems as well as the essential services that our health as well as our life depends on. If we speak of health systems, we should underscore the different effects that it has on health and the interconnection there is between human beings, animals, and the planet, of course. There are five known uh, pathways that are interconnected and interrelated through which food systems can have a negative impact on health and nutrition, especially when the food systems are guided by um, profit and productivity, which can cause disease and the absence of welfare. And it affects mainly the most vulnerable groups of society, such as children. In this case, we see on the image that the first is unhealthy diet and food unsafety, which contribute to malnutrition in all its forms. Paula mentioned this when she spoke of the growing rates of over overweight and obesity, as well as non-communicable diseases related to diet. And then on the other hand, we see a persistence of malnutrition and uh, micronutrient deficiencies. The second road refers to contaminated foods, unsafe and adulterated foods. In other words, additional to the fact that the food and water contain dangerous, infectious, or toxic products like micro, 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 microbial or chemical substances, which can cause different diseases and disorders 
like micronutrient deficiencies, uh, growth delays, emaciation, communicable diseases, or even non-communicable diseases, and even mental diseases. The third road refers to zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance related to those diseases that are transferred from animals to humans and obviously cause about 2.5 billion cases of diseases a year. The fourth refers to current food systems con contributing to environmental pollution and planet degradation as a result of the use of fertilizers and products containing heavy metals or uh, disruptive chemical substances in all this process of the food supply chains, as well as the intensive agriculture and monocultures, which is the relationship between, for example, the production of ultra-processed uh, products and sugar beverages, which promote the development of many forms of malnutrition, and as well are based on the monocrop like sugar and soya, which also have a, an impact on the environment. And in this uh, item, we see that climate change in loss of biodiversity takes place. There's deforestation, there's changes in the use of soil, an excessive use of water, uh, the green gas emissions, and the uh, problems on the soil. And the last row depends, re refers to occupational risks, like physical and mental health of persons working in the food systems, which can be due to the nature of their work, or due to the environment in which they work. And now, throughout the webinar, we have been addressing the importance or the relationship between the food systems promoting or avoiding all forms of malnutrition through healthy eating. But what is healthy eating? According to the World Health Organization, healthy eating is the basis for health, welfare, growth, and optimum development. Evidence shows us that health benefits of a healthy diet rich in uh, cereals and vegetables and fruits and uh, legumes and dry fruits, which must also be low in salt, in free-flowing sugars, fats, and in saturated fats and trans fats in particular. I think it's important that we mention that a healthy diet begins at a very early age with the adequate breastfeeding, and the benefits of a healthy diet translate into better educational results, productivity, and health throughout the life cycle. Some of the characteristics we should take into consideration when saying that the diet is healthy and sustainable is that it be accessible, affordable, safe, equitable, and culturally acceptable, but that it can allow for growth and development of all, supporting the operation and physical as well as mental and social operation at all stages of life in all generations, present and future. It's also important that they protect against all forms of malnutrition. Also, uh, non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and other diseases. In addition, we have to be able to support uh, the biodiversity. A sustainable, healthy diet uh, will allow us to reduce the greenhouse gas effects. And last but not least, the characteristics of this type of diet, we see the combination of three dimensions, social, economic, and national. We not only try to 
open our eyes regarding these other aspects, but also just to consider the entire overlook. We have several guidelines to have a healthy diet based on the recommendations of WHO, including the consumption of micronutrients and macronutrients, and just so that we can see which is recommended by WHO. For instance, uh, WHO recommends the low consumption or avoidance of the consumption of total grease, free uh, and fat, fatty acids and others. Just to close, I would like to say what is important for us, and that is how we can use this information, how we can use this information to favor health. WHO and PAHO are advancing in the transformation of these systems to see what are the main actions. For instance, fiscal policies to have healthy and sustainable diets, public policies for the acquisition and provision of food services for a healthy diet, also the transformation of food systems, regulation of advertising in foods and beverages, and also regarding maternal milk substitute. Also, food safety. This is essential to promote life, life and health. Frontal labeling of foods based on the directives and guidance of PAHO and WHO. Also, the production and reformulation of food. For instance, also labeling that we should eliminate trans fats and the enrichment of and fortification of foods. To end, I would like to underline that this is a very important force. It is a driver to combat bad nutrition in all its forms. We have to think of investments. We have to think of having better structurally sound systems to be able to have healthy diets. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Leslie for your clear presentation as to how these systems can be sustainable and if they are sustainable, the impact that they have on food and nutrition and the need to transform these food systems. Now we will hear a very specific example of the maternal milk substitutes and then how this production of milk formula impacts the environment. Uh, Judy Smith, uh, Associate Professor of the National University of Australia, will talk about the environmental implication of breast milk substitutes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Julie Smith and my presentation will be on the environmental implications of breast milk substitutes. The world has a growing problem of paediatric malnutrition, underweight as well as obesity. Commercial milk formula qualifies as an ultra processed food but is fed to a growing proportion of infants and young children. A range of evidence points to commercial formula and its marketing as an important driver of the global epidemic of obesity and chronic disease. In a 2009 study, my colleague and I estimated that up to a quarter of some chronic diseases in Australia in the adult population may be attributable to the epidemic of formula feeding in Australia during the 1960s. 
Here you see a picture of the long-term trends in breastfeeding, marketing and formula sales in Australia from 1904 through to 2000. There was a precipitous decline in breastfeeding from the late 50s, which coincided with a surge in marketing to health professionals and women via journals and magazines, and a correspondingly large expansion of the formula market. These trends are paralleled in many countries. There's been a rapid growth in dairy milk formula sales in lower and middle income countries in recent decades. Here you can see the trends in East Asia and the Pacific, where there's been particularly rapid growth and also in Latin America and in the Middle East and North Africa. Rising sales of formula translate into reduced breastfeeding. This has important consequences both for health and for the environment. Breastfeeding has been seen as a double duty nutrition action, both reducing undernutrition and overnutrition. But breastfeeding is also a triple duty action in terms of addressing the global syndemic of undernutrition, obesity and sustainability. The three pillars of policy in relation to climate change are mitigation, adaptation and resilience. Breastfeeding addresses all three, but invisibly. Visibly. On adaptation, briefly, milk formula is maladaptive to climate change. A population with high breastfeeding rates is better placed to adapt to climate change risks. Breastfeeding provides adaptive nutrition, fluids and responsive care, strong immune responsivity and optimal organ development. Breastfeeding is also relevant to population resilience, meaning being prepared for crisis. Children reliant on commercial milk formula are more vulnerable to climate related crises like food supply disruptions, falling agricultural productivity and rising food prices. In emergencies and disasters, formula reliant babies suffer particularly from food scarcity and lack of water and electricity. But what I want to talk about today is mitigation. The environmental impacts of milk formula are substantial. I'm going to focus on the effects on greenhouse gas emissions. Infant formula generates between eight and 14 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions for every kilogram of powder. The amount of formula needed to feed an infant for six months is between 20 to 21 kilograms of powder. This generates about 250 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions, about twice as high as for exclusive breastfeeding. The amount of water needed to make infant formula is also very high because it's made from cow's milk or similar. Water use is more than 5,000 litres per kilogram of powder over the product life cycle, mostly during the production stages of milk powder. Studies have also considered the country level effects. For example, a study of three North American countries found emissions associated with sales of milk formula products in Canada, Mexico and the United States average 59 kilograms of, of CO2 equivalent gases per child age 0 to 3 years. Another study estimated the greenhouse gas emission for six Asian countries, Australia, South Korea, China, Malaysia, India and the Philippines. The environmental impacts of declining breastfeeding in China are large because of its large population and escalating use of formula products. Around 660,000 tonnes of powdered milk products are sold in China each year. This work has also highlighted the huge contribution of so-called growing up or follow-up formulas. Around half the carbon footprint of milk formula is from these products. These products are stated by WHO to be unnecessary and potentially harmful to child nutrition and health. But they cater to demand created by what the industry calls life pressures, such as mothers returning to employment, and by the supposed health or environmental marketing appeal to consumers. 
These rapidly expanding markets are in effect created for industry by government policies which fail to protect breastfeeding from misinformation and greenwashing, that fail to ensure women have sufficient paid maternity leave and maternity protection, and by policies that permit health and maternity care practices that promote formula use by disrupting breastfeeding from the very start. The research just outlined underpinned development of the green feeding tool. This diagram summarises the basic design for the calculations made by the tool. It focuses on breastfeeding practices among infants aged less than six months. It looks at the scientific evidence that I've mentioned to calculate the carbon and water footprints. It can also calculate scenarios such as the impacts of interventions or policy environments on carbon or water footprints. It's flexible so users can enter their own data for a country or to scale down to local levels. And the tool also allows adjustments to estimated impacts for programs needed to ensure adequate nutrition for mothers. So here are some of the results from the tool for different countries. Most countries in the data set are low and middle income countries because high income countries don't collect sufficient quality data. So in low and middle income countries alone, the use of dairy formula for infant stage aged less than six months results in annual footprints of around six to seven and a half billion kilograms a year, and which is equivalent to around two million cars on the road for a year. It would take 318 million trees planted to absorb this. Water used during the product life cycle for this amount of, of milk formula is around 2.6 trillion litres, which is the equivalent of a million Olympic swimming pools. The green feeding tool has multiple uses. It can quantify and make visible the contribution of women, track progress, and compare countries. It can also inform the updating of policies and programs and help advocacy and motivate greater investments. A number of interventions have proven effective in, in increasing breastfeeding rates, including paid maternity leave, adopting and enforcing the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, promoting the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding, as well as more and better counselling for mothers. The tool can also give women, individual women, greater confidence and motivation for their breastfeeding. I just want to briefly mention our Mother's Milk tool, which covers infants and young children up to three years of age. Using this tool, it can be calculated that every year the world loses about 22 billion litres of the perfect baby food because governments fail to invest in support for women to keep breastfeeding. The Mother's Milk tool like the green feeding tool, provides for improved policy, visibility and awareness of the importance of breastfeeding to a country's food systems and economy. Norway has led the world in recognising the role of breastfeeding in providing food security and healthy nutrition to children. Since the 1990s, Norway has included mother's milk in its food balance sheets. This makes the importance and value of breastfeeding more visible and more likely to be invested in. Inadequate data for monitoring infant and young child feeding is an impediment to balanced policy in many high income countries. We invite you to join us in utilising these tools to advocate for promoting breastfeeding, improving nutrition and health status, and building a healthier and more sustainable food environment for infants and young children. So, to conclude, the current expansion of markets for commercial milk formula is a maladaptive response to climate change. Commercial milk formula has substantial carbon and water footprints and other environmental impacts. Breastfeeding is the healthy and sustainable food system for infants and young children and must be protected from marketing and supported by strong policies. The green feeding tool quantifies breastfeeding as a crucial element in building a healthy and sustainable food system and allows breastfeeding interventions to be advocated as a carbon offset initiative under funding facilities such as the Clean Development Me Mechanism. The value of breastfeeding is substantial but mostly unmeasured. This 
invisibility distorts public policy and investment priorities. More investment in breastfeeding is urgently needed to avoid further harm to health and planet. You can find more information here. And I'd like to acknowledge the support of the team at Alive and Thrive and the ANU, both on the Mother's Milk tool and the Green Feeding tool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for this uh, very, uh, very good presentation. Uh, we, we can really see that uh, protecting uh, breastfeeding uh, also has an effect, positive effect on our uh, food systems and on our environment. So now that we have heard several presentations, we are going to uh, look at the video uh, where we can learn a little bit more about the experience of uh, of Chile. Um, vamos a ver un video ahora donde... We will now project a video from Chile. We will uh, learn about life histories about this topic in Chile. So let us be attentive to this video. We can't hear anything. Could you please turn the volume up? Now. We are not hearing anything. Please give me a minute. Thank you. Can you put your microphone on mute to see if it goes? Yes. Yes, uh, when you are uh, sharing the slide, you have to go to optimize so that you get the video sound. Otherwise, we will just go to the next presentation and later on we will just be projecting the video if you agree. So. We have now Michelle Alvarez. Are you ready to present? Michelle, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Leo. Michelle is a consultant from UNICEF and she will be talking about food system and children obesity. Yes. I am a specialist in uh, food systems for the regional office of Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, Julie. And thank you all the colleagues for your excellent presentations and for your participation in this webinar. As we have seen in previous presentations, uh, we have unhealthy uh, food systems that have, have negative effects on the environment and affect children, mainly. Undoubtedly, malnutrition in any other form continue to be, continues to be a problem in Latin America and the Caribbean. This system has failed children and adolescents in Latin America by denying them uh, information to adequate uh, food. And they, for that reason, cannot reach their full potential. One of the main challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean for children for prevent of underweight are many factors related to migration from rural to uh, urban areas. So Latin America and the Caribbean is the most urbanized uh, mm, and developed area 
uh, with 85% of their population that lives in urban areas. For that reason, we have unhealthy environments and ultra processed food and lack of physical activity. We have a high level of ultra processed uh, food and then low availability of healthy foods. So Latin America and the Caribbean has the highest cost of healthy food in environmental areas. Uh, sedentary lifestyle is also a problem. The distance uh, to work uh, reduces the time for physical activity. And also children do not have adequate spaces for uh, exercise and physical activity. On the other hand, in the past two decades, we have seen the uh, sales of uh, ultra processed food increase. Uh, we have seen an enormous activity in the production of unhealthy food and then and junk food and then as Julie and others have said, many studies that have been undertaken by UNICEF on digital marketing and ultra processed foods in Argentina, Mexico, Guatemala, and Colombia reflect that there is a wide variety of aggressive and innovative strategies by the industry so that they can sell their products to the uh, underage uh, children. They have hashtags, they have videos, they have all kinds of advertising targeting the most vulnerable population. And this study shows that about 95% of children and adolescents report that advertising that they see in the social networks is uh, related to junk foods and ultra processed uh, food. And one of which five children consumes uh, junk food after seeing this advertised on the internet. All of these strategies have had a negative influence in children and then this influences consumption of, of this junk food at a very early age. So we should really target mothers, adolescents and caretakers and tell them about healthy food. As Leslie said before, the lack of uh, regulatory frameworks and policies also is a problem in the marketing of all of these uh, problems. We have to have proper monitoring in the uh, sale of these uh, products and also be concerned with uh, uh, just not observing the mother's uh, milk substitute code. And this is one of the main challenges in the region. We have interference in the generation of evidence and also in the approval and implementation of regulatory framework for the prevention of overweight and obesity. This continues to be one of the main weaknesses in our region. Next one. So despite all the challenges, we have great opportunities to counter the situation. UNICEF offers interventions through the life cycle to prevent all kinds of malnutrition, including overweight. The faster we act, the better we will be able to solve all of these uh, challenges and the higher the impact in the lives of children. As we can see here, when we have interventions uh, during the adult years, they are important, but they may be too late, a little bit too late. And as my colleague said, it is essential to be able to act from the beginning of life. UNICEF and their partners have also uh, uh, prepared and developed the Innocente framework. And then there we put the children and adolescents in the center here. And then we see how the food environment impacts children and adolescents from different levels. How we can see how a healthy diet 
goes through different social factors, external factors, the school, um, and then the chain of supply. How this affects the behavior of children and caretakers and the personal environment. And all in this uh, environment, we also consider the characteristics of the family and caretakers uh, and see how they influence children's nutrition. All of these components are interrelated and then they are affected by several social factors, environmental factors, political factors, and others. But here we verify, clearly verify several elements for decision making so that we have policies to improve the supply and demand of nutritional products for children. Thank you. Just to ensure that we have a nutritious and sustainable diet for children, it is important to work at a multi-sectoral level, as it was mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. We have to take into consideration the role played by the educational system, the health system, the food system, and the social protection system. We want to make sure that there is a food system that promotes healthy diets, beginning with breastfeeding uh, from six months to two years, and then complementary, adequate complementary uh, food, and then healthy foods for children and adolescents. We want to make sure that there is a food system that is within the regulatory and policy framework to combat all forms of malnutrition. In addition to having a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approach, it is essential to use a multi-sectoral approach to uh, uh, and use uh, relevant indicators uh, targeting children and adolescents. Also, to have four pillars to redesign new uh, feed food, food programs, and then to consider all the uh, social characteristics and cultural characteristics of each country. We have to give priority to food and nutrition education in the school system and the first level of care. Also, urgently, we need to transform urban environments that are unhealthy for children and adolescents because th those are the environments where children live, grow, learn, and enjoy life. And we have to ensure the existence of social programs, especially food uh, programs in the schools so that they facilitate access to healthy foods. Como mencionaba mi compañera Leslie anteriormente y, y, y conversaremos más adelante, es indispensable la formulación e implementación de políticas y marcos regulatorios que reduzcan la disponibilidad, accesibilidad y compra de productos no saludables. Debemos de también establecer mecanismos de blindaje de conflicto de interés por parte de la industria al momento de generar evidencia y en espacios clave de abogacía. Es fundamental involucrar a los niños, niñas y adolescentes en decisiones que determinarán su futuro. Y por último, eh, y, y es de los aspectos más importantes, debemos de invertir, continuar invirtiendo en investigación, en la generación de datos y sistemas de información para orientar políticas y programas basados en evidencia. Afortunadamente, gracias a los esfuerzos que se están realizando en los distintos países, existen muchas oportunidades para aprender unos de otros y seguir construyendo un mejor futuro para la niñez. Y creo que ahí lo dejo. Ya, yeah, muchísimas gracias, uh, Michelle. Vamos a ver si ahora podemos ver el uh, video de Chile. Haremos otro intento. En la ventana hay más comida chatarra que comida saludable. <ríe> en la publicidad se ve como <ríe> todo perfecto, la comida. así grande. Como por ejemplo en una pizza se ve así como cuando se paran el trozo, así todo pegajoso. Es una adicción eso.
en La Pintana la venta es mucho de comida no saludable. Es mucha fritanga, que el churrasco, que las papas fritas. Eso es lo que hay mucho acá, es lo que creo que más se vende. Antes yo consumía comida chatarra, eh, grasa, corocina, fritura. El médico me decía Escrito ahí. que estaba obeso, gordo. No me gusta esa palabra. Los territorios donde los niños, niñas y adolescentes viven son fundamentales, cruciales para el buen desarrollo de un niño o una niña. Una comuna como La Pintana posee más obstáculos para poder contar con un acceso a alimentos de forma saludable con respecto a alimentos de calidad versus otras comunas del país. Algunas familias realmente tienen la oportunidad de optar por esta alimentación, pero no es la realidad de todas las familias de Chile. Cuando quiero comprar productos saludables, tengo que dirigirme al supermercado, porque en la feria no venden productos saludables más que las verduras y la podemos encontrar más baratas, lo cual igual implica que sea un gasto extra, porque es más caro lo saludable. En la feria es más cerca. Al supermercado puedo ir caminando, me demoraría más, pero también se puede ir en micro. Es un problema muy grande. Qué bueno sería que en esta comuna hubiera un lugares para poner co comer tu comida saludable. Pensé a pensar en los tipos de enfermedades que me podía dar si no bajaba de peso. Por ejemplo, diabetes o problemas al, al corazón. Que me asustaba porque yo me cansaba mucho. Demasiado me cansaba. Tomé la decisión de cambiar de hábito para mí. Lo que comía, lo que consumía. Para... Ahora yo consumo eh, comida saludable, verdura, fruta. En vez de tomar graciosa, tomo jugo o agua. No, nosotros ahora comemos más en la casa, porque a mi mamá le gusta, ahora le gusta preparar más comida. Honestamente, al principio fue difícil, pero después uno se va adoptando, acostumbrando la, a la dieta y, y se le abre un mundo. Yo me siento orgullosa de él. Bajó mucho de peso, se volvió un niño más seguro. Entonces, completamente, le, al comer saludable, le cambió la vida. Al gobierno, si yo lo tuviera en frente, le diría que los costos de los productos saludables sean más bajos para la accesibilidad de las personas que lo necesitan. Porque no todos podemos pagar los productos saludables. Yo le pediría al, al gobierno tener más conciencia y tener, que hayan más locales donde se pueda vender comida saludable. Tener más comida saludable que chatarra. Thank you very much. And we clearly see in the video that to have the will to change is not enough. We, we really need to have a healthy environment as well, one which allows us to make good choices. I don't know if you can see me. Yes. So I think that it's time to go to the next presentation where I'm going to talk about some of the recommendations we have to improve these food environments. And I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see my presentation at this time. There you go. Thank you. So, I'd like to mention that in 2014, 
the executive committee of FAHO for the first region of FAHO to approve a plan of action and it was approved unanimously for prevention of obesity in children and adolescents. The objective of the plan was to curb the accelerated increase of the epidemic of obesity in children and adolescents. With a multi-sectoral approach addressing the whole life course to change the eating environment, promoting greater consumption of healthy and nutritious food and increase in physical activity. So the plan has five lines, five strategic lines of action. The first is primary health care, promotion of breastfeeding and healthy eating. Second is to improve the environment, particularly regarding school, where there is good nutrition and an environment that allows to allows the children to practice physical activity. The third component is related to fiscal policies and the regulation of advertising, promotion, and food labeling. The fourth component is other multisectoral measures, and the fifth is surveillance, research, and uh, evaluation. We are monitoring this plan of action. Initially, it was to last five years, and there's been significant progress available on our webpage. But there are some policies which have been the most effective that have not actually advanced as we'd wish. We have, for example, in the schools, a guideline for public purchasing. And it is an excellent measure for the food systems, which we'll hear from the colleague from Brazil's presentation, because as we promote healthy food for children, we're also supporting small producers to produce food like fruits and vegetables. Another measure are the taxes on sugared beverages, which has shown to be very cost effective, as well as the uh, limitations on the advertising, the front of the package labeling, which allows you to clearly and quickly identify the foods that have excessive salt or uh, saturated fatty acids or free sugars, which can be easily understood by even those that have a reduced educational level, and it's easier for them to identify what foods do not comply with PAHO's criteria. And there are other indicators which talk about improving family agriculture and the price of the foods. As we've heard, frequently the access to nutritious or healthy foods is a problem, and uh, the advertising is greatly, is mostly on unhealthy foods. Two years later, in 2017, the World Health Organization created a high-level commission to put an end to infant obesity with people from different sectors and with different experiences who gave the governments a series of recommendations in six areas, promotion and consumption of healthy food, promotion of physical activity, it includes also the life cycle from pre 
gestational and prenatal care up to the diet and physical activity during first infancy, health and nutrition and physical activity for school-aged children, and treatment with special emphasis on children because that's when it's easier to prevent and what you learn as a child always has an impact throughout the person's life cycle and that's why it's so important to consider the breastfeeding as we saw Tajo and uh, UNICEF are always promoting the implementation and adoption of the international coding of the breast milk substitutes, which are seldom uh, respected and is usually advertising infant formulas. There's a recent resolution from the World Health Assembly urging manufacturers and distributors of infants and children's food to put an end to all forms of inappropriate promotion as established by the uh, guidelines. Often, the products for younger children contain greater amounts of of sugar and sodium, even more so than for adults. We also promote the friendly hospital initiatives, friendly for children, so that all hospitals and maternities promote the importance of breastfeeding. And the regulatory policies, which Leslie already showed, these are the seven lines of action that WHO proposed to change the food system for the benefit of health and nutrition. And finally, I'd like to mention as well that the WHO two years ago adopted a world plan to accelerate the curbing of obesity. And this plan includes a series of recommendations measured by its impact, viability, acceptability, worth, uh, affordability, and scalability in the different systems, including, of course, the food system, but also the health, the social protection, sports, urban design, and built environment, the educational system, and the information and digital environment systems. And the technical package includes all these policies, which have already been mentioned, with nine countries that have pioneered in the region applying these initiatives at scale to put an end to obesity. To conclude, can uh, curb the recent epidemic of uh, obesity to put an end to obesity amongst infants and adolescents. And the uh, cre three crucial um, periods of lifestyle uh, prevention of pregnancy, lack of um, breastfeeding, first uh, years of early childhood and adolescence. It also requires regulatory policies of a multi sectoral nation without conflict of interest to create healthy food environments to make the healthy selection the easiest. Thank you for your attention. And I will stop sharing here. So we have now another video from Mexico. And we'll then have some of the experiences from the countries and reminding you that the Q&A section can show you the questions so that we can respond better. And maybe at the end, we might have some time to respond during the plenary to some of the questions. We'll continue with the uh, 
video from Mexico. Se les comunica a todos los alumnos que a partir de la próxima semana se dará inicio a la construcción de un comedor escolar. ¿Qué? Este comedor estará listo en dos semanas y todos los niños deberán comer en dicho espacio. Todo ya está listo para comenzar. El comedor será un caos. ¿Quién se va a encargar de cocinar? Señores, no podemos olvidar los altos índices de obesidad que hay en la escuela. No, pero mi hija no come. Y además, seguramente va a ser es nutrióloga y quiere hablar con nosotros. En la mañana les repartieron a sus hijos estas bolsitas en la entrada. El consumo de un refresco al día incrementa en un 55% la probabilidad de sobrepeso u obesidad. Las pruebas científicas actuales demuestran que la implementación de los comedores escolares es muy eficaz para la prevención del sobrepeso y la obesidad.
I think I'm going to continue now. I don't know if Leo, Leo wants to make any kind of introduction. I thought that I was speaking, but it turns out that I had my camera and microphone off. Yes, uh, we have two presentations of country experiences, and we're going to hear the uh, experience of Fiorella Espinosa from UNICEF in Mexico. Fiorella, thank you, Leo. Well, first I want to thank you for the invitation for this opportunity. I'm sorry, we lost her for a minute. Applied to Mexico. What is the context of Mexico? Not much different from what we've already seen. Here are the figures of overweight and obesity, especially obesity, which has increased in recent years. Today, we have a prevalence of 37.7% in school-aged children from 5 to 11, and more than 40% amongst adolescents. As for their food in Mexico, the children and adolescents are consuming a large amount of ultra-processed products. It's interesting to note that even the younger children are the ones that have an even greater amount of calories coming from these ultra-processed foods, which we know have high contents of sugar, fat, sodium, calories, additives, and other unhealthy additives. How to deal with the problem? Well, this is something that we have been repeatedly heard. There's a conceptual framework of what are the uh, nutrition determinants to address them comprehensively. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to uh, consider the measures that have been implemented in Mexico to change specifically the healthy environment. So as you see on the chart, there's a lot of interaction with practices and improvement in the quality of the food, water, etc. I'm going to refer specifically to the measures that UNICEF has managed to support governments with. And I didn't want to neglect the fact that it's not just these determinants that are more structural that they set the examples and the underlying ones, but also uh, we also hear the commercial health determinants or nutritional determinants. And another thing that was mentioned by Michelle as well is that at UNICEF, we have a systemic approach where the food system is extremely relevant, but also we have to deal with the problem to, from the social protection, education, water, sanitation, and health points of view. And with the example I give you, I think this will be clearer. We've said also that these are the most cost-effective measures. We have to begin with these. And in Mexico, we're regulating the sale and distribution of foods in schools. This is since 2010. There are fiscal policies. There are taxes since 2014. So we also need subsidies. The nutrition labeling, we know that since 2020, we have a warning nutritional labeling in Mexico, which has reformulated many of the products and reduced a lot of the critical nutrients content, as was mentioned. And there's also been advertising regulation for food and beverage, particularly those um, substitutes for breast, meeting, breast milk, which we had a reform in 2014, which I'm going to refer to in a minute. But I didn't want to forget that these measures have been evaluated specifically for Mexico. We have figures uh, accounting for the cost effectiveness of these measures, as well as the important return on the investment of many of these. I'm going to show you the link so that you can access it. It's a very interesting article. I'm going to focus mainly on the front of the pack, front of the package labeling. In Mexico, they change the general law, contrary to others where they've generated new laws. So that's a, something I'm going to share with you as well. In 2020, we decided to reform the health law, the education law, to regulate. This happened in 2019, and then we had the change of the 051 rule, which referred to the labeling and demanded a GDA type of labeling. But this change brought a warning label to Mexico, which aside from the five seals, it had two precautionary labels 
to protect the children in terms of their consumption of caffeine and sweeteners. Then there were some ministries as a result of Peru's experience where we tried to learn from other countries and learned that if we allowed the product of uh, smaller sizes without the seals, those are the ones that are being sold in the schools or outside the schools and that are geared towards these children. So we didn't want to neglect the opportunity of at least adding some type of warning. If all the seals didn't fit, well, then maybe we could warn numeric. In June of 2021, after a period of transition and an extension that was given to the companies, there was a regulation whereby all products with that seal could not use any um, celebrities or, or comic strips or anything that attracted the children, nor could they add any type of recognition of a medical organization or anything like that. So this is what it looked like before in Mexico with the, the characters, the GDA labeling, but without any warning of the presence of caffeine or sugar or sweeteners. Now it looks like this. There's no more characters. There's the warning labels and the, the, the caution labels. Now, since we've been doing this for four years now, we've been able to have the evidence showing in UNICEF as well as in Tajo documents showing not only the processes in Mexico but in other countries. We've also analyzed the arguments we've heard as authorities during the public consultation where we clearly see that the arguments that came from the industry or the partners of the industry were arguments that had nothing to do with public health, nor did they based themselves on scientific evidence, contrary to the comments of those who were in favor of the label. We want to share because we all want to know what the results of the policy have been. Last year, we published a review of the results of the International Food Policy Study Survey of 2021. Just as we were implementing the label system, uh, surveying uh, 1,696 adolescents and 7,775 adults, and their answers were, were the 39 and 45 percent respectively bought less products with seals and uh, texts. And this mentioned the Coke uh, refreshment, either diet or regular. These figures increase with uh, greater decreases amongst the different groups. The first is the women, persons identified as indigenous, persons with overweight persons with a greater educational level, persons with greater knowledge of nutrition. And here, this is particularly important, which is found in other studies as well that have also been published, especially where there's a greater effect in the homes of children, mothers and fathers, who are definitely trying to protect the food of their children. And then, of course, important persons with a significant role in the purchase of the food with such a little more evidence. I also wanted to mention this campaign, which is Heroes for Health. This was conducted through the Secretaries of Health. We have had very good results because we have had dissemination of news about the campaign in the media, and it has covered more than 200,000 children. Because of time, limitations. I will not extend my presentation anymore, but I just wanted to give you a general idea of what we have. We have some rules uh, by, of the General uh, Secretariat of Health about advertising and then protection of consumers. This was 2024. <clears throat> and with this, we're trying to strengthen our rules. So the initiative uh, presented uh, in December 2023 uh, was the one that led to this uh, Consumer Protection uh, Act. And all of this uh, has been the effort that we have made uh, starting in the pandemic and taking into consideration the platforms 
available to us. We have promoting, have been promoting healthy lifestyles, education, um, behavioral changes, both uh, explaining theory and practice, just to make sure that the changes are understood. We already have several textbooks incorporating all of this. Uh, educational uh, systems and programs for schools. We have made a big change uh, from a cold breakfast for children to warm breakfast for children. And these warm breakfasts for children are foods that have been prepared a few minutes before the children get there. We still have just preliminary results, but we have been able to cover from 35% to 64% of the beneficiaries in these schools. And then we ha also have an act on uh, environments, healthy environments. And there we discuss labeling, we have also discussed the ultra processed uh, food. We mentioned also that it's important to show whether there's a conflict of interest in the implementation of regulations. And we specify the responsible authority for sanctions. And then we have, of course, different programs that change in the schools uh, every five years. So the general law for adequate and sustainable food and diet was approved in 2024 by the Chamber of Representatives. And with this, we should have more policies and more programs targeting school food and school feeding practices. And also we cover small and medium level manufacturers of food for these cases. This uh, alliance that I'm mentioning here is not only for Mexico, but this is for the region, but we are participating in this global alliance for the healthy diet for children and adolescents. And we were working through the Latin American and Caribbean chapters. We are urging the governments to implement 10 recommendations to support and protect children and adolescents diet. And we have presented this formally to a Congress in Cuenca in Ecuador that was held last year, October, 2023. And this has been coordinated by the National Institute of Public Health and UNICEF in Mexico. And with this, we want to strengthen all the efforts that we have already made. So to end, I just want to give you an update of the measures we have taken in Mexico. In the schools, we actually have published all of these guidelines. Also, we have published the uh, uh, new norms on labeling. And it is important to make sure that these are permanent changes. So the study shows that we have to implement a system of subsidies. And this is what PAHO and WHO have advised. And then also we want to publish the most important guidelines for proper implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Fiorella. It's so good to know about this experience from Mexico. It has been very good to see that uh, Chile was the first country that began to implement this type of law. And now we have seven countries that have been implementing this uh, frontal labeling of food products and that regulatory 
measures have been established, such as restriction of advertising, the taxes to sugary drinks, and then the work done in the schools. And also, I would like to mention that uh, consumer's education is also an important point. And uh, in the questions we see that we have not included this, but I would like to emphasize the fact that WHO has the best buys, uh, which show the uh, most cost-effective actions, the regulatory policies that reduce the demand for ultra-processed uh, products is also very important. And for that reason, we have less production right now. And because of that, the diet and food system has been transformed In some cases, we see that cost effectiveness has not been achieved as we would have liked to, because in many areas, it is very difficult to introduce uh, changes. But with frontal labeling, we are educating consumers. And then uh, a cross-cutting measure is just uh, the advertising of all of these regulatory and the publication of these regulatory uh, steps. So the last presentation will have to do with the experiences of Brazil in school food systems. And we will see in this example, the multiple benefits for nutrition and uh, of this experience. Ana Carolina Silva from the Ministry of Education of Brazil. Uh, Ana Carolina, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will need to. Okay. Uh, we'd like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Ana Carolina and I work in the Brazilian. Are you hearing me? Are you listening? Sí, yeah. lo vemos bien. Yeah. See it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we feel grateful for joining for such a relevant discussion and thank you for the invitation and thank you, Fiorella, for the for sharing such inspiring experience. So I will now share our most recent experience in the Brazilian school feeding program. Yes, the, the problem we try to solve is that no one can properly learn if they are not properly fed. Therefore, the Brazilian federal government sends municipalities and states a monthly complementary budget for providing materials for our students. PENAI is a public policy with more than 60 years now, and through PENAI, we offer meals to more than 40 million students every day in the whole country. Our overarching guidelines are the right to food, healthy and adequate diets, universality of care, the promotion of sustainable development, social accountability to ensure participation, uh, food and nutrition education. In addition to financial resources decentralization, can I also regulate how that budget can be used? For that, our dietitian team, working with other institutions and society as well, uh, define which kinds of food can be can or cannot be bought, and in what proportion. The observation of those rules, which I will show you in a few moments can be later verified because municipalities and states will need to present our PNI team their purchase invoices. In 2020, aiming at preventing malnutrition and pro at promoting food and nutrition security, we have updated the purchase guidelines. The process was based on social discussion and guidelines and models from the Brazilian Health Ministry 
and the Pan American Health Organization. So we defined new parameters for food acquisition and supply, which limited the purchase of processed and ultra-processed foods to a maximum of 20% of the budget. In addition to that, at least 75% of the municipality budget will be addressed to fresh or minimally processed foods and 5% maximum to the acquisition of processed culinary ingredients. We also have defined mandatory offers. School have to offer fresh fruits and vegetables. Students who attend school have period will have access to fruit at least two weekdays and to vegetables at least three weekdays. On the other hand, full day students will have access to fruits four days a week and to vegetables five days a week. Another mandatory rule refers to the offer of hand iron and vitamin A sources in our schools. This decision was based on the persistence of pandemic nutritional deficiencies in Brazil. The new uh, regulation also predicts individualized care for students with malnutrition and other illnesses and specific parameters for children aged under, under three. Uh, for instance, it's not allowed to offer those children ultra-processed food or recipes with the addition of sugar, honey, or sweeteners. I would also like to show you our list of not allowed at school items. It has increased in the new regulation. Before 2020, only beverages like soft drinks, artificial refreshments, and syrup-based drinks were forbidden in the school environment. Now, we have added to the list other kinds of ultra-processed food, including those with additives and sweeteners, and very sugary foods and beverages as well. Those are very relevant rules at changing the way and I can help us prevent childhood obesity. Of course, um, municipalities and schools are still adapting to this new scenario. Nevertheless, our dietitian team have already seen good results uh, after those changes. Uh, those perceived changes impacted mostly schools attended by children under three. And we are very satisfied uh, since we are collaborating uh, with healthier habits as well. After sharing all those acquisition parameters with you, I would like to advance to the discussion of uh, to the connections between food offer and food systems. This is a significant issue to the PNI team, since our biggest present day changes uh, challenges are connected to it. It is relevant to state that what contextualizes and supports all those new acquisition rules is an advice implemented before in the year 2009. In that year, we decided that at least 30% of Penai's budget should be spent on acquisitions of smallholder farm products. The idea was to ensure food and nutrition security at schools, along with promoting sustainable development. After that, our procedures and methods have changed a lot. In 2022, we registered 45% average it is on, on those purchases from smallholder farmers. The alliance with smallholder farmers ensures healthier diets by increasing the amount of fresh products available in schools. It also helps us increase the dietary diversity needed for balanced meals and promotes the observation of local eating habits and culture at schools. On the other hand, by selling their products to Penai, those farmers increase their incomes, boosting local economies. If we follow the money, we can see that through those purchases, Penai's resources circulate locally. It's not only the cultivator's income, but also part of the bakers, the streamers, the, the seamstress, and other workers in the community. Another advance is that smallholder farmers' purchases promote short food supply chains 
and a large variety of agricultural practices with positive environmental impact effects. To ensure this kind of purchase, we implemented a simplified process where smallholders farmers are exempt from bidding and prices are not a criterion for the farmer selection. Moreover, considering the Brazilian scenario, we also took a step further and decided to prioritize purchases from indigenous and quilombola communities popular agrarian reform settlements, women farmers groups, and agroecological producers. PENAI is a strategic program for promoting the right to food in Brazil because it can induce local practices. Therefore, those trajectory shifts encourage the multiplication of more inclusive and sustainable agri-food systems. Um, for instance, indigenous gatherers with ancient knowledge on integrated living into forest environments sell their gather, gathered products to Penai for our schools. Additionally, we can endorse regenerative agriculture. The picture on the right shows a small farm, which is also an agroforestry school. There, agroforesters cultivate food while restoring those damaged areas in the inner part of Brazil. The vegetable area we can see here is also a forest bed. With time, a forest grows, making refuge for a variety of species. I would like to add that the way we position ourselves as humans in relation to other species is a key issue when it comes to food to the food systems discussion. In this agroforestry school, very much inspired by indigenous knowledge, an important lesson taught is to observe the other species' behavior, to jointly learn how to collaborate with life processes and promote balance between different species in a growing forest. As an anthropologist, Doing research on that farm, I could learn that food systems transformation requires that as humans, we shift senses to a humbler perspective and to a less colonized way of perceiving cultivation. Penai's budget is also part of those agroforesters' income uh, as they sell these crops to school, they grow forests, they observe other species, and they teach that to other people and help ensuring health diets uh, to our students. Uh, for all that, I finish with a quote from the anthropologists, both book and share. Another world is not only possible, it already exists. I add that we need to allocate our efforts and resources there. Thank you very much. Ok, muchas gracias uh, para esta presentación. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. We see that Brazil is a pioneer, is a, a pioneer in uh, local purchases for the school to increase the production of healthy foods, nutritional foods for schools. There are some questions in the chat. And I would like to ask my colleagues to please respond. There's a question as to how children can distinguish or to know which are ultra processed foods. Also, there's a question for UNICEF about Costa Rica, where they new law or act is being uh, promoted for frontal labeling of food. And this is for UNICEF and also for PAHO. How do you support the participation of organized civil society in the uh, development of policies targeting uh, food systems that are free of conflicts of interest? 
how can you have uh, UNICEF support in Costa Rica? So Paula, this will go to you for ultra processed foods and, and then for UNICEF support in Costa Rica. Yes, thank you so much, Leo. First of all, I think is how a child could understand if this is ultra processed. Yes, in reality, in specific technical terms, as we understand it in this discussion and in these presentations, but ultra processed itself, the child is not going to understand it. However, the, we understand the marketing uh, strategies used by the manufacturers to influence upon the, ch the child. So technically, as an ultra processed food, children are under the influence of marketing techniques utilized by the industry to be able to choose this type of product. In the presentations we saw that they use influencers, they use uh, animation, they use cartoons, is uh, music, uh, a, a lot of uh, elements that they use because they are in every environment. In they are in the streets, they are in the environmental um, areas of the schools. So somehow or other, this affects children in different environments in which children are always uh, working. And then, of course, this violates uh, the right to adequate information, the right to adequate nutrition, and the adequate uh, health care. I don't know if my colleagues, uh, Michelle, if you want to add uh, to this question or answer. Yes, what Paula has said. Yes, there are several communication strategies for uh, behavioral change and social change to be able to generate key messages adapted to children, mothers and care providers, parents in general, using several resources to be able to work with them, uh, adapting all of these messages to age and social cultural environments. Anybody else would like to add? Yes, very briefly, I'd like to compliment what I put in the chat in Mexico, we were not able to have the definition as ultra processed uh, foods uh, in that label. So we think that labeling could be just a gateway so that children can distinguish uh, ultra processed from non ultra processed because uh, everything that promotes health, that's what it is. Children understand labeling. So we have to have something that the children understand in general, and we just wanted to complement several aspects in the health campaigns. Thank you so much. And we hope that we can support Costa Rica and other countries with the strengthening of the civil society. Yes, we go to the second question from Costa Rica. At the regional level, we are promoting a practice community just to make sure that we have a very close coordination with the civil society and the academia. Last year, we had the first regional event in which we incorporated the social, civil society and the academics with the participation of 20 countries of the region. And we are working on the integration of more countries of the region, some countries, they have some limitations because they may not have nutrition officers. In Costa Rica, we do have one. So if you send me an internal uh, email, I can establish uh, a direct contact with our uh, nutrition officer uh, in my institution. But from within UNICEF, we always want to provide technical support to the countries that promote these initiatives for regulation, for instance, Mexico. Uh, he has uh, shared with us uh, 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 his experience uh, and Argentina has shared their experience too. And we want to have a focus on childhood and adolescence. So these discussions 
have to be envisioned within the standpoint of uh, children's rights and children's interests. So in Mexico, we have implemented something new that was started there. I do not remember if we are said to avoid sweeteners for children. It's not recommended for children uh, and caffeine is not recommended for children. This is something that we were able to do with Mexico. And I think in the past we have had this experience from Mexico and also from Argentina. And this is something uh, that UNICEF has strongly advocated for. And there are other elements focused on the protection of childhood rights and children's rights. So in Costa Rica, we have supported this and we will be able to support this uh, through the UNICEF office. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. So there's a question, Leslie, this is related to frontal labeling uh, that uh, has already uh, been discussed in the chat. Yes. Are you trying to define the parameters? Yes. Yes, if you could tell us the parameters for health instead of saying excess. In general, these parameters take into consideration the nutrient profile established by PAHO, which is based on the guidelines of WHO, where it is defined through scientific evidence, very strong scientific evidence, that there's no conflict of interest or interference on the effects of these critical uh, ingredients. We call them critical ingredients because they have a detrimental effect uh, on health, like sugars, added sugars, uh, total fats, saturated fats, trans fats, and the rest. So in this case, we have included this in the nutrient profile of PAHO with the different ranks and levels for each one of them. And this helps not only for labeling, but also for other food policies, such as what foods uh, should not be sold in schools to avoid consumption of these foods or excessive consumption of these critical uh, nutrients that are uh, very detrimental to health and also that could cause chronic diseases. Thank you so much, Leslie. So we are getting to the end of this webinar. There are a couple of more questions. I will refer very quickly to them, one of them. Starting at which age uh, should you incorporate nutritional uh, education? And I would say as soon as possible, not as a separate uh, uh, discipline, but cross-cutting through uh, games, especially in nurseries and so forth. And also uh, when it comes to uh, breastfeeding, we incorporate uh, little by little all complementary foods, and that is educational uh, or nutritional education. And this is uh, using natural ingredients just to make sure that the child is getting accustomed to the natural uh, flavors of the foods. If you have any legal uh, policies to restrict the uh, consumption of uh, milk formula that is not nutritionally sustainable, yes, through the code. Yes, uh, we can restrict the advertising of milk formula uh, because uh, we're trying to restrict the consumption of uh, milk formula. But we don't say we are prohibiting this, but I think it's a mother who has the ability to forbid this, but this is something that is being taken into account. And regarding complementary uh, foods, for instance, uh, that are low in sugars and low in salt in Peru, we are including this in the labeling uh, so to make sure 
that it is known that these uh, foods are high in sodium or salt and fats. Also, regarding monitoring in the schools, yes, definitely that is complicated, but it also is also important to have an initiative, not only from the health sector, but also through health and education and to see if there are any local products. Uh, yes, also the uh, agricultural authorities uh, work with that uh, in monitoring. And then also another question regarding physical activity. It is very important. And I would like to mention that child obesity uh, uh, is a result of excessive uh, consumption of unhealthy um, foods with high energy and low nutritional value. Um, physical activity helps, but if we we have a, a soft drink, then you need to 10 to 15 minutes of exercise to burn up all the calories. Fiorella, do you want to compliment? Yes, Leo, thank you. Just to monitor our schools, I'm happy to see that Viviana Vajarp is with us. She's a nutrition director in the state of Yucatan, who's one of the 32 Mexican states. and. Actually, UNICEF has been happy to cooperate there because one of the things we've done is to support them in developing a monitoring system of the school environment. And there's been about two years of work that we did where we did a diagnosis of 459 schools. But just to help at the time, well, we're already starting to document the case. And I think that that's going to be shared so that it can be used as an example in the region. Yes, thank you. We can share that and also mention that we're going to uh, upload the recording of this webinar in our webpage so you can see it all again if you want. And I also want to refer you to our UNICEF and WHO webpage where there's a lot more documentation on this topic. I want to give Paula from UNICEF the floor for some final comments. Paula? Ah, sorry, I had muted myself. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Leo and Pajo College, for organizing this webinar. And thank you all to the colleagues who are still connected. There's 441 people still online. And from UNICEF, just to underscore the importance of childhood in food systems, what we hope to do in these spaces mainly is to consider the different roles and spaces in which we participate to highlight the importance of children and their rights and the higher rights of children in the food system. We've seen how dramatic the situation is. It's a serious problem, the overweight and obesity in the region, particularly in the children and adolescents between 5 and 19. We see that 100% of the region is highly affected by this problem. So. We have a long road ahead at all levels, in the United Nations agencies, in civil society, and in academia, so that we can actually strengthen the regulatory frameworks in our country to prevent overweight and obesity regionally. That's all. Thank you, colleagues, for this webinar. And thank you, Paula. From Pajo. I want to thank all the speakers. We've seen how important this problem of infant obesity is. Not only does it affect the child, it affects the adult as well. And 
society as a whole with an enormous expenditure, all as a result of poorly functioning uh, food systems that give priority to high energy, high caloric, uh, and low nutrient foods with a great deal of fats and sugars, and mainly uh, promoted amongst the children with the low price, with a lot of advertising. We've also seen that there are many cost-effective policies and measures throughout the food chain, but above all, we see that in reducing the demand for these products, we are managing to change the productive aspects and contributing to changes in the food system to make them more sustainable. With that, I'll thank everyone for being with us and we'll adjourn with a video and we hope to see you soon some and uh, thank you no, we'll end with the video.